start with Mr. Adams over there. Hey. I'm a big fan of his work. And we, I know as a DJ, I play probably everything he's ever done, but yeah. it's part of the Leroy. Right? Yeah. I just want to let that be known right now. What, 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 what? Who are you? <laughs> I am Patrick Adams. Yeah. Yeah. I produced my first record about four years ago, actually. And Leroy was... was uh, <laughs> Leroy, Leroy was the uh, lead singer of the group Black Ivory. Yeah! yeah. was my first uh, hit production. Uh, shortly after that, I became a and director of Perception Today Records. I worked with Fatback, worked with... Um, Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. great stuff. A whole year, this goes on. Yeah. Uh, left there in uh, 74, started my own production company. Um, around that time, I and Greg Carmichael um, did uh, the Universal Robot Band stuff. Um, and then we were calling like Peter Brown, not to be confused with Peter Brown from Florida. Uh, there's a promoter in New York named Peter Brown, and he and I, um, did the PNP record stuff, uh, Cloud One, Atmosphere Strut, Great stuff. And a whole lot of other stuff. Yeah. Um, I still rock that record. In 78, uh, I uh, had a good I had a good run. <laughs> um, <laughs> did the uh, Herbie Man Superman album, did the Freak album, um, you know, Catch Gary's Revenge Freak, which includes the weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, between between '77 and '81, I think I worked on 22, 22 album productions. Um, Rick James, Big Time, which Leroy and his partners wrote. Um, got to produce Eddie Kendricks for Arista. Um, did some work with Melvin Moore. Um, it's, it's a lot of stuff. Oh, all right, so then we go to the 80s. Oh, I, I did court, I wrote and produced court up in the One Night Love Affair. Oh, yeah. um, shortly after that, uh, Greg Carmichael and I produced uh, Touch Me All. I wrote Touch Me All Night Long, and um, Greg Carmichael yeah. and I produced it with Fonda Ray. Uh, later, the song was redone by Kathy Dennis yes. in 91 and right. became like the top yes. three record all over the world. Um, yeah. Um, and in, in the 80s, um, as things were changing, uh, my, my solution to staying in a studio environment where I could learn what young people were doing, coming up with, you know, new things. Um, and it sort of became a laboratory environment, but I, I became chief engineer at Power Play Studio in Long Island City. And um, over a, a four or five year period, uh, I engineered Salt and Pepper's first album, uh, Eric May and Rob Kim's first three albums. Yeah. Um, Dana Dane yeah. with Fame. Um, and as chief engineer, um, kept trying to find solutions because sampling was just starting. Um, there, there was no real way of doing certain things, but we kept trying to uh, find ways to solve problems, which sort of became the bedrock for how rap records got made. Um, and then after that, uh, in the last 20 years or so, uh, a lot of it has been uh, people sampling my stuff. Like I've been sampling by um, a lot of people. <laughs> Everybody. Uh, most recently, Mac Miller on his last album. Um, and it, it's a lot of stuff, but my, my name is probably on about 1,200 records <laughs> over the last 40 years as either a writer, arranger, producer, or any combination of things. I'm good, all right. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> You're still doing it, man. God yeah. bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess. Hey. hey. Hello. What's up? Yeah. Uh, my name, as you may know, is uh, Leroy Burgess. Hey. And I sit next to uh, the gentleman that I consider to be my mentor. All right. He introduced me at the age of 14 uh, wow. into the music business and uh, with my very first group, the group that would become Black Ivory. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, Black Ivory, yay! Hey, um, hey, uh, over the course of my career, I've, I've been blessed to do a lot of songs with a lot of great people, a lot of wonderful people who have blessed me with their talent and, 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 and just their good vibes. Uh, music is everything to me. It's everything. You know, I, I eat, sleep, and breathe music every single day. And uh, Patrick has the foresight to believe in me, not just as a singer, but as a songwriter, composer, so forth and so on, and arranger and producer. And under his tutelage, I learned to arrange, orchestrate, conduct, play better, be better, so forth and so on. Um, if if uh, in two years from now, I will be active in the music business for 50 years. Wow. Grace of God, and um, I'm so grateful for you guys and the support of people like you and my fans and, you know, because if y'all are not there, there's no reason for me to do it. So, um, and uh, the fact that y'all have embraced my work and, uh, you know, just show me so much love, I, I can't thank you enough. Uh, I continue to perform with Black Ivory. I continue to perform on my own. Uh, we're working on new stuff. <laughs> we got some surprises coming out. Um, I've uh, recently been blessed to work with the great Louis Vega, um, the, the great Kenny Carpenter, which is something new, um, um, and just so many wonderful DJs uh, and, and producers, uh, and they just help me continue growing and continue expanding, because music, as you all know, is infinite. It doesn't stop. It doesn't have a beginning and it doesn't have an end. So I'm somewhere in the middle, you know, doing what I do, doing, you know, and just thanking God for every moment of it. So uh, that's my short story. And thank you so much for having me. Okay, who's going to go, Ray? Okay, Mr. Caviano. Uh, I love this man, sorry. Good evening. Um, I'm going to do a short, because I don't want to waste time. Okay. I'm going to be here all night. Um, and there's another panel coming up that, uh, right after this. Uh, uh, the short version is that I started with my first record company gig even before, uh, as a teenager working for various uh, high school bands and Rolling Stone magazine and various magazines back in the underground music scene. Uh, but my first record company job was with London Records. And uh, there I was involved with promoting and doing artist development for acts like Al Green, ZZ Top, Moody Blues, The Rolling Stones, Gilbert O'Sullivan, John Mayo, Steve Breakers, 10 Years After, etc. And I moved on to uh, working with a guy named Miles Copeland, a company called British Talent Managers, who was the brother of Stuart Copeland of the Police. And we did. Uh, uh, worked with Sire Records and, and Seymour with Renaissance, Wish Thrown Ass, etc. And I was working with, uh, in about 76, give or take, uh, an attorney named Alan Grubman, who's one of the biggest entertainment attorneys now in New York. And he introduced me at that point in time to a guy named Tommy Matola. Oh. And I was seeing that something was happening in New York at the Loft and uh, various other underground spots, the 10th floor, the firehouse. Fire Island, uh, what was happening in the outer boroughs in the Bronx and otherwise, that there was an energy being fostered together. And I put together a network of clubs 
man who helped me in the early days is with 20th Century Records, a guy named Billy Smith. And he helped me formulate getting to know the club scene. He was very instrumental in helping me. And I formulized it and uh, went ahead and did a project for Tommy called Dr. Bazaar's Original Savannah Band, which uh, went out to the platinum. Uh, Corey Day of that uh, Savannah Band is going to be performing tonight. She only had her hits yeah. to Pow Wow and Green Light. Yeah. And then I met another manager named Ted Hollis. He was the manager of a young lady who was thus passed away with a major hit called Turn the Beat Around, Mickey Sue Robinson. Yeah. Then Alan introduced me to uh, a guy named Henry Stone. Yeah. Henry! And uh, that was it. It was all best for wealth at that point. I had a great list of communicating with jocks from San Francisco to Miami to New York, Bo Crane, uh, Joey Carvello in Boston, and John Luongo. And, uh, San Francisco, etc. And I had this network, the Billboard Reporters were just being formulated. Vince Aletti, who's going to be on the panel, helped put that together. And with TK, we had hit after hit after hit. T Connection, Peter Brown, yeah. Ralph McDonald, oh, I signed Voyage, oh. Boris Midney, the list is endless. Foxy, yeah. Get Off, KC yeah. the Central, Anita Ward, George McRae, who yeah. sold 80 million singles. Yeah. And with the success of TK, this was in around late 79. Um, uh, I did an independent project for Warner Brothers. Henry led me out to uh, Mo Austin. And I did an independent project with Madeline Kane, for Vision Love, that Jim Berners mix. And uh, that went to number one. And I don't think Henry should have let me out to Warner Brothers because they opened me a deal, which was the birth of RSC Records and working all the Warner Brothers product. Chaka Khan, George Benson, uh, on my own label, uh, Luther Vandross with Change and Gino Socio. Uh, we did a project with uh, Leroy and Patrick of Venus Dotson um, that did well in the clubs, Night Rider and Shining. Um, and, you know, so the, that was a, a great ride. And then uh, moved on, did independent promotion after I left after the so called Disco Sucks movement. Uh, <laughs> took my artists and did independent promotion. I did a lot of acts to Jackson, Yellow, Plastic, Duran Duran, etc. Uh, even promoted for Yoko Ono, Walking on Thin Ice, if you remember that. Oh, yeah. And then at that point in time, about a year later, I went to Atlantic Records and continued with Change and Gino Socio and Lace and a whole bunch of uh, acts there, working Laura Brannigan and Gloria, and the list goes on. And now we move up to the new era of RFC Fresh has been relaunched about, what about now, over a year? My two colleagues here of Leslie Jones and Jane here. We signed uh, Melissa Morgan as our first artist. We're now working a new project, Peter Wayne. We got some other things in the ballpark. It's also a multi entertainment company called Fresh Entertainment. We've done multiple concerts. And in talking about mixers, the two mixers that I worked with a lot of mixers, since this is a mixers panel, and the two mixers that I really worked with that would do great work for me was uh, Jim Burgess, the late Jim Burgess, yeah. and the late Larry LeBaron. Yeah. You know, he did to Jimmy Ross for me, he did yeah. Lace, yeah. Jim did Chains, Lover's Holiday, he did Forbidden Love, he did Do You Think I'm Sexy for Me, Rod Stewart, etc. So that's my little, there's no left time left, right? Tom, uh, <laughs> hey, I'm just here. Yeah. 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 You're more excited yeah. than yeah. I am. Your resume is ridiculous. Yeah. Come on, Steve. Steve Thompson, everyone. Yeah. Oh, I feel honored just to be around everyone here. I think everybody knows a little bit about my background being a DJ from New York and Long Island. Yeah. <laughs> a couple of years ago, uh, it, it's kind of interesting. First of all, you know, um, being a DJ when I started, there wasn't really many clubs that had DJs unless you went to the gay clubs. Not really many straight clubs. And uh, I actually got into DJing by accident. Because I would go to this club, the uh, Leone's in Deer Park, and they would have bands performing. And then um, if the band went on, you had a jukebox. So I said, hey, why don't you put a DJ in there? This way you keep the excitement going on. Now, understand, I was working at a record store, so I had a pretty cool record collection at the time. It's probably about 71, 72. So I get a call a month later, it says, hey, we just put in a DJ booth for you. And I'm looking at myself. I don't know anything about this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now but I had a good gonna... record collection. <laughs> now I gotta do it. <laughs> so that's how I started. And uh, after a while, I started getting my chops together. Jackie McCoy was very nice to let me go into the Long Island DJ record ball. 
And I'll never forget this one time. I don't know, does anybody know Vince Michaels? Yeah. 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 Vince Michaels gave me two words that stay with me today. And I love him like a brother, and I, I, I sadly miss him. He heard me DJ, and he said, Steve, I go, what? You suck. <laughs> Probably the biggest motivating factor anybody could ever get. I don't know if you remember Jackie. Jackie says he stole my fucking life. I love it. I mean, did somebody come up and say, you suck? That was pretty cool. So, again, started to get my thing going on here. And life was hell as a DJ before 1100s. 1200 just came out. Yeah. I hated Thorns turntables. I was a big fan of the Bozak mixes because yeah. I like faders better than not. But there was another point in my life where I thought I really sucked as a DJ, and that's when I heard Paul Casella and Jackie McCoy, by the way. I said, God, I got a long way to go. So at that point, I was hanging out with Phil Silverman a lot, and we just, we would go crazy because, you know, when you were DJing, you work till four in the morning, and we always wanted to get the edge on everything, so we'd get our records from the record pool. We'd uh, go to bed about five in the morning, wake up at eight, take a train, go to Manhattan, hit all the record companies. And then, like, on Thursday, Friday, go to Rock and Soul, downstairs, uh, oh my God. Vinyl Mania. Vinyl Mania. Yeah, we had to get our imports, because, you know, and yeah. we went back to the school of BPMing, you know, because, you know, we get a stack of records like this. We want to make sure that Friday night we played everything, so take your 15 seconds out and BPM on. And what I find, I'll just talk a little quick about the DJ before I get into production work. Um, I love working on four turntables. That was my thing. You know, the more the better. And I understand everything about technology today with Tractor and, you know, you could put your whole set on, on a little USB and just plug it in the computer. But I don't know about any DJs out there, but I love the, the manual. You know, even the wicker wicker shit, you know? I love that manual just like, I mean, you know, when, when music came out in the early 70s, if a song started at 160 beats per minute, it doesn't mean it stayed there. That's right. Okay? So you, you, you're, working, you're working that pitch control forever. Yeah. Today, Tractor, any song today is 132, it will be 132. <laughs> okay, rest is short. I'll say, where's the, you know, and I love, I, I go to the, uh, EDM festivals. I've been to Ultra, Electric Daisy, and all that. And I gotta be honest with you, I got goosebumps. I remember the first time I saw Carl Cox, Tiesco, Skrillex, Deadmau. Um, yeah. Um, and I got goosebumps when I saw 60,000 kids with the best light show in the world. It made Pink Floyd's light show look like nothing. And see the energy of that crowd and what they did, and I felt like a grandpa saying, "Well, at least we started something," you know. And I was very proud. I was like a proud pop boy when I saw that, you know. So you know, everybody talks about you know what was like DJing then and now. It's I guarantee you guys, if we had that technology back in the day, we would fucking use it. <laughs> but you know. Anyway, getting to uh, making records, which was interesting. Um, Roy B, you in the house? He's outside. He's outside. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. He's Mr. Steroids. He's at the bar. <laughs> <laughs> All right. In 1976, I believe it was, we had our first opportunity, I believe it was Phil and myself, to work on this record called Disco Hustle. And the idea was Adam made Roulette was put together the top club artists of the time and put a compilation together. So obviously we started with Donna Summers, I mean, how could you go wrong? I think it was Crown Heights Affair, or maybe it was uh, Down to Love Town, I'm not sure what the set was for us. But we put the album together, sequence of like a dance party non-stop. But you couldn't use records, I, mean, I think we had to use reel-to-reel -reel tapes to sequence it. And then they wound up making us be in the TV commercial. And Doing the hustle on a TV commercial was probably one of the low parts of my life. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to make a long story short. So I believe that record sold 12 million copies. So it made Mars leave even more money, okay, which he really needed. But we got no credit on the record. Thanks, Roy. But uh, to make another long story short, we talk about the TK days. A friend of mine, Ron Braden, one of the club Barrymore's, in Long Island, 77, used to DJ there. I'll make a quick story. He left there, I'm working at Uncle Sam's with Mike Arado, another great DJ. And 
he got us to get in with Henry Stone. I would say, let's see what you can do. So we wound up taking a song, like I think it was Sully B, Fly Me on the Wings of Love. Mike Arado and myself, we did edited it, you know, phase it, plan it, just make it extended. Henry loved it, so he hired us. So that's when we went in, we did Catman Do the Break. Yeah. Uh, Take a Chance, Queen Samantha. Yeah. Yeah. Thing. I know we did George McRae. I mean, we did so many things with TK. Uncle Louie. James Bradley. At midnight. Huh? James Bradley. James Bradley. Thank you, sir. Mr. Yang. T Connection. Oh, we didn't do T Connection. I, I would love to take uh, credit for that, but not. Yeah, you know. Great <laughs> so I, we wound up doing all these remixes in 79, and then when the disco suck here, when I went back to the clubs, stayed in the clubs. And then in the early 80s, I got a great break to work on r and BRs from Stephanie Mills, Cameo, Barcase. I started doing all this r &B. Then, as you said, the music switched, and I got into working with a called New Wave. You know, I did Talk Talk It's My Life, Psychedelic Furs, uh, Shout to Ishma Fears, uh, God, uh, Heartbreak Beat, uh, Missing Persons, David Bowie, uh, and we started doing all that work. And then we went back to pop music again, and you know, I worked with Madonna on Open Your Heart, uh, Whitney Houston, um, I Wanna Dance With Somebody, and Aretha Franklin, who's Zoom and Who and everything, and I was doing all that. And believe it or not, I was getting bored. So I called my manager at the time, I said, listen, I need to do something fresh, so I give me some rock stuff to do. So I hooked up with Geffen Records, and the first two projects I did were Guns N' Roses, Appetite for Destruction, and Tesla. So all my dance friends said, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> Is Judy Weinstein here? No. Judy? She's at the bar. She's at the bar? <laughs> <laughs> Is she really? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I started doing all these rock projects, and it's interesting, when you're in the music industry, whatever your last record was, that's what you do. That's what, yeah, that's right. And what really pissed me off, I made a, I, I mean, I went from Johnny Mathis to fucking Korn. <laughs> okay? I did Begin to Begin, which is one of my favorite records I ever worked on. I love that record. And, but it's quite interesting, you know, because I've always wanted to be diverse in what I do. And so then, you know, I started doing like uh, Cinderella, Tesla, Dokken, Alice Cooper, and Soundgarden, this and that, and he got, I got bored again. Uh, so I, I need to do something different. At the end of the 80s, you know, we did great. We sold a lot of records, it's not like Trump now. Um, I, I was getting sick of the rock music, you know, hearing bands like Poison and Warren. You know, I said, if this is where rock is going to go, I don't want anything to do with it. So I got a call from a friend of mine saying, hey, I just signed this new band. I said, great, what's the name of the band? It was Soundgarden. Would you be interested? And I listened to them, I said, oh, this is perfect for me. So I stopped DJing full time, probably around 87, 88. The studio worked out a lot. And what I love about working in the studios compared to DJing is, you know, I'm a writer now, an arranger, a producer, a mixer. And I just love creating with great artists in the studio. I mean, nothing gives me more excitement when you bring great musicians in the studio and be able to communicate with them. I mean, I was fortunate to work with the best singers and the best musicians in the world. And now, obviously, it's a little different. You know, you could just, you know, like, as far as remixers go, all right, just give me the vocal and I'm gonna create a whole new track around it. When I did remixing back in the day, we had to use the original production and add to it. You know, and I kind of like that because you you kind of wanted to keep the integrity of the song. And there's a are we out of here, Willis. We're gonna need to wrap it up. But go ahead, Steve. Go ahead. You know, as far as remixing, you know, since I've been a remixer or producer, I can see the whole spectrum of how to craft a record. And what I tell artists today, you know, say you're working on a record. Hey, it could be a dance record, but it's a ballad. Great. Let's put what we feel it defined the best version on the album, and we can do a remix. Real easy. I remember I produced Ziggy Marley, People Get Ready. We won the Grammy for that song. And uh, I forgot, somebody remixed it, but I don't know how the song went from 82 BPMs to 142. <laughs> you know, I mean, I like reggae, so, you know, I just want to get that little shake going on there.
But it, that, that's what remixing today is, you know, with all everything done on a computer, you kind of lose that human quality, I get it. You know, it's dance music, I mean, I, I think my favorite productions are a lot of EDM tracks. You, I mean, I love the production of them, but I wish they would work on songs more. You know, if they had great lyrics, you got a winner, because I think the productions are stellar for the most part. Anyway, that's, 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 that's enough okay. about me. Yep. Patrick, you've been articulating for quite a while now. I've seen you actually write narratives. Uh, being, you know, somewhat not controversial, but yeah, talking about the whole element of going back. I mean, we can't turn back the clock, if you will. But where do you see the trend from a producer's point of view and getting back to more of a song-oriented type business, whatever the genre is, R&B, EDM, uh, dance music, or however you want to slice it. What's your perspective now in terms of moving forward with the music? My my um, my problem is really not on the creative end. Um, you will always the cream will always rise to the top. Um, I always used. To, I had a staff of 34 writers at one time. And I used to tell them, you know, don't come running in here with something that you wrote in five minutes and expect me to record it with somebody. Because while we're sitting here doing this, there's some kid in Ohio or out in Texas somewhere who is taking weeks and sometimes months crafting um, a great lyric. You know, like um, Diane Warren uh, is my favorite person. Uh, every time I hear one of her songs, I say, damn, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> because the lyrics are so, um, I mean, you, you can relate to them. So I, I tell my writers and I tell producers who I work with, um, whatever you do, the product has to be something that the audience has to care about. They have to relate to it. When they hear a song, they have to say either, yeah, I know how you feel, that happened to me, or that didn't happen to me, but I still know what it means. Um, so what I'm saying is, my problem is with the industry as a whole, that at this point, it has devolved and devolved and devolved because uh, what we have always called the suits, you know, the accountants and the, the uh, lawyers. They're running the show. Yeah, they're running the show, and it's for them it's like, give me another one like the other one. Give me something I can make money with. It has, it has nothing to do with talent, has nothing to do with creativity. It's just about making a dollar. Um, someone had me go to YouTube and listen to a certain genre of records. And I gotta tell you, I stuck with it for an hour listening to this, that, 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 that. And then I called the person back and said, what did I just listen to? I listened to an hour of nonsense. You know, um, they say the internet leveled the playing field. It did level the playing field, except that now that playing field is like a beach and you've got millions of grains of sand and everybody thinks they're going to get rich overnight. You know, the whole, uh, you know, uh, American Idol, blah, 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 blah. It's giving a lot of people false hope. ASCAP used to have 200,000 writers. At this point, there must be a million people who joined ASCAP. And truth of it is, they're never gonna make money. That's the truth. I got a statement from Warner Brothers. I mean, I, I love Warner Brothers, but I got a statement from Warner Brothers the other day for $15. Yeah, streaming revenue. He's streaming. Which is a whole, that, that's the whole thing itself. Can I, can I answer what you're saying here? Yes. I understand. You know, obviously Patrick's been making music warmer than me. I look at it this way, when I write music or I'm working with an artist, you know, I'll use the Taylor Swift principle. 
I want to define what my audience is, and that's how I determine how to write for that artist, okay? Now, obviously, every generation has their own way of saying things. You know, I'll give you, for instance, if, if you wrote a song like the Beatles, there was number one song, She Loves You, yeah, 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 they'd laugh you out, okay? Maybe it goes, I'll tap that ass, yeah, yeah, yeah. Different. But every generation has their own way of saying things. And, you know, and I understand what Patrick's saying. I agree with it. I mean, I produced three or four songs that Diane wrote. I produced one for Joe Cocker, a couple for Expose. Great songs. I mean, she jacks you. Know, I love Diane. She just won an Emmy. That song she did with Lady Gaga. And I agree lyrically. But again, working in the music industry today, and I agree about streaming. You know, the record companies are making their money off of uh, advertising and the backs of the creators. See, the problem is with artists today is they don't have any contracts, streaming revenues. I mean, and that's what I loved about Cliff Bernstein and Peter Mensch. They got digital rights years ago. So the artists are not covered for the wave, wave stream. Now, you know, if you look at, as you looked at, I've seen my streaming revenues, and I think it's a joke. Uh, but thank God my records are still selling today, but you know, you're getting point zero 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 point six on a thing. But streaming is, is twofold. First of all, streaming is basically you're getting paid to play on radio. The, the, the people do not own the song. It's not like buying a CD, okay? It's a radio. You're getting paid for radio. Now here's the deal. My feeling is, and I've always said this, how about we make music that's worth buying? I mean, we can look at Adele, we can look at Taylor Swift, we can look at Bruno Mars. I mean, um, you know, obviously the EDM guys, they have their own niche. They'll just throw it out there. They just make tracks and everything. I think um, there are exceptions to the rule. Avicii, I think he's retired now. But, you know, I really feel that, you know, I'd love to see where's the new Marvin Gaye. Where's the new Aretha Franklin? Where's the new Led Zeppelin? And I feel that it's important that we as a music society have to give them that vehicle. If we're going to think American Idol is a be-all and end-all, who cares about perfect pitch? I mean, that's all it is. It's karaoke perfect pitch. Where's the human quality of a voice? Where's the human quality of songs? Why don't you just um, jump in there? Okay, jump in. Hi. What's missing to me? What's the problem with, with the music industry besides it being taken over by the suit that Patrick described uh, is quality. The quality of music has changed, gone down significantly, you know, to the point where most, most people, when you hear them talk about today's music, there's one thing that they all say, it sucks. It sucks. <laughs> it sucks. I don't want to listen to it. I don't listen to today's radio and so forth and so on. And Patrick, wait, 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 wait. And, and Patrick and I have had a conversation, many conversations in the past, about the 60s and 70s, how when you turn on WABC or WMCA or something like that, in the course of a half hour to an hour, there was so much diverse music that inspired you in different ways, taking you into rock and R&B, and dance, and so forth and so on. All the young creative minds, the 12 and 13 year olds, which I was at that time, all right, our minds started going in terms of what can I create? What can I do? How can I make something good? See, because what we have out here today is not so much good as it is effective and functional. You understand? And that's not something I need to listen to. <laughs> you understand? When I listen to music, I want to be inspired. I want to feel it. I want to be moved. I want it to take me somewhere, all right? In case I'm in a bad mood, I want it to make me feel better. In case I'm in a good mood, I want it to make me feel even better than that. That's what music is not doing these days, all right? Because the formulaic way that they are looking at, that corporations are looking at putting out music, it doesn't serve what music used to serve, which is the soul. Feed the soul. Make everybody feel good. You understand? No matter whether you were imparting uh, uh, a message with some negativity or a political message, or if you were talking about love or something like that. 
You understand? You made the person, the listener, become a part of that experience. And when you mention Marvin Gaye, all right, Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder, Aretha Franklin, they draw you in with their talent. You understand? Today's, a lot of today's artists are not talent driven. It's not about, about it. unfortunately, the way the business, and I believe me, my favorite singer of all time is David Ruffin. I don't care mm -hmm. anybody says. Yeah, there you go. Okay, well, see, we were spoiled. We grew up in a different generation, okay? How do you top Motown? How do you top, you know, from Pink Floyd to Zeppelin? You can't, okay? Today's generation, again, I have to respect them. They want to listen to shit that their parents aren't going to like, and they're doing a good job of it, okay? I mean, every generation's done that. I mean, classical music used to be considered heavy metal. I understand that. I get it. I mean, you know, I was working with Public Enemy and Wu-Tang. Hell, I know my parents were going up, what the hell is that? You know, I get that. You know, today's lyrics have been dumbed down. I get that. I mean, you listen to Nicki Minaj, okay? I mean, Jerry Lembo, you work on a lot of this stuff. No, where is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, wait. Okay, you know, I remember, I remember writing a song. I remember writing a song that's called Kiss Me Strong, and it was kind of like a Rihanna meets Britney Spears song. It was really cool. And it was a very suggestive sexually, but it, it didn't say, you know, get really crazy. And I remember Nene Argyne saying, yeah, we could, but the lyrics aren't dirty enough. Mm. And I see you're not leaving much up to you. See, I like writing songs that double and triple and dangerous. Mm. Leave it up to people to think about it, you know? It can mean everything, okay? That's how I write lyrics. I mean, I, I, I'm more fun writing music. That's what works um, in, in films like um, Psycho, where you never actually see yeah. the, the, the violence. Well, it's, it's, it, it, it leads it to the imagination, and it helps you think and thereby making you a part of the creative process. Yeah. Right? Because you have to fill in that blank. And you have to fill in that gap. And that's one of the things that makes music so wonderful. Okay. So that, the absence of that is something that I think well, yeah. we'll all miss. I totally agree, but understand two things of what's going on today. The kids today do not value music the way we used to because there's other things to keep them busy. Uh -huh. You have this, yeah. you have your texting, you have your YouTube, yeah, but it keeps them busy, okay? They don't, I'm not saying they're wrong, and plus they're used to getting it for free. All right, okay, how many people here, okay, I like this song, uh, okay, I, I like this song here, I'm gonna, I can download for free, why am I gonna pay for it? That's a problem, okay? If you wanna deal with the record comes again, they figured out a way how they can get their revenue stream going without having to pay a lot of money. And again, you know, we all want, the only way that we're gonna change music, again, Every, again, every generation has their own way of saying things. You know, we like to educate the young kids. Okay, we, we need to do that. But we need the vehicle to be able to do it. Record companies are into, you know, 12, 13, 14 year old pop artists. I mean, you know how Taylor came out and everything. And I'm working with this girl now, she's 16, she's gonna be whatever. But, you know, they wanna get the quick fix. They wanna hit the board members on the first quarter and just keep smacking them out there. You know, they're. You know, their job is not to find, okay, if we look at hip-hop, it's all mumble hop in there now. Okay, I get that. You know? <laughs> we gotta get moving. Oh, we gotta move. Uh, again, this was a great panel, and we can, we can go to a midnight. Uh, I just want to have one final word. This is gonna be a big segue into our next panel about the state of music, state of past, present, and future of dance music. But I'll say this from a producer's point of view, and from my vantage point of having signed music, promoted it, etc. that however you slice it, whatever the genre, whether it's Calvin Harris, or Johnny Gill, or Tyrese, or whoever it may be, it's still about fundamentally a song. So from my position, and working with the gentleman here at RFC Fresh, what we first look at is the strength of the song. We'll figure out everything later in terms of how it's gonna be promoted and marketed. If I have a strong song, then we can move forward, no matter the suits, the streaming, or whatever. Yeah. And we're gonna talk about the state of the business in a minute okay, here great. for the next one. Okay, let's make some noise for Ray Campiano, Steve Thompson, Leroy Burgess, and Patrick Adams. Good to you to Midnight. Great job, guys. Great job, very interesting. Okay, we got